This is part two of our video clip on electronegativity. In the first clip, we talked about how electronegativity affects the type of chemical bond that's going to go occur between two atoms. So for instance, in an ionic bond, uh, it occurs generally when one atom has a much higher electronegativity than the second atom. And because En values, the higher they are, the more likely that the atom is going to attract electrons towards it. And so because chlorine has a higher En, 3.0, versus sodium, 0.9, the electron is ripped away from sodium and given to chlorine, resulting in a one negative charge because electrons are negative. Sodium, having lost the negative electron, is more positive because of it. And so we have ions now, sodium ion, chlorine ion, because an atom is, or rather an ion, is an atom that has lost or gained electrons. And so this is called an ionic bond. Over here, in a covalent bond, it generally occurs between two atoms that have similar or identical En values. All right, so in this case, chlorine versus chlorine, they both have an En value of 3.0. So this electron circles here half the time and circles here half the time. No chlorine is going to get the electron more than the other one. It's like a tug of war between twins with electrons in the center. Because they both have the same strength, theoretically, uh, neither of them is going to win the race or win the war more than the other. Then finally, we have the polar covalent bond, also known as the in-between bond. So we looked at either end of the spectrum, the spectrum where it's like a tug of war between a baby versus an adult. And then we looked at the very equal sharing of electrons, where it's between twins. What happens if one atom has a slightly greater advantage than the other atom? Well, that's where you get a polar covalent bond. So what happens in this case is because the En value for oxygen is 3.5, whereas the En value for hydrogen is 2.1, it's not a total ripoff, so it's not an unfair fight exactly, right? where the one is, uh, atom has a bigger, much, much, much bigger En value, but at the same time it's not an equal fight either, where they're identical. So it's somewhere in between. What happens is this electron pair over here spends most of its time orbiting around the oxygen, because oxygen has a higher En value, 3.5, so maybe it'll circle here 10 times and then orbit here once, just because uh, it's like a tug of war between an adult and a teenager. Technically, the adult should win, but, you know, teenagers can be big. Uh, they can usually get in and put up a good fight, right? So for every 10 orbits over here, it might orbit once over here. Thus, since the electrons stand over or orbit around this oxygen more often, it gets a negative charge, whereas hydrogen gets a positive charge. However, it's not a total ripoff like you see up here, so we say a partial charge occurs. Right? Not a complete charge, not a complete permanent negative and permanent positive, but a slight negative and a slight positive. So this little symbol here represents a partial charge. So the question now becomes how much of a difference in En values is required to be considered a, a, an unfair fight, right? to be considered an ionic bond? And how much of a difference or how close should the En be in order to be considered a partial charge and not a covalent charge instead. That's where the electronegativity difference comes into play. So electronegativity difference is symbolized by the delta sign. So this triangle means delta. That's the Greek letter, uh, capital Greek letter D, EN. So difference in electronegativity numbers. Now delta EN can be represented by a scale from 0 to 4. Meaning, if the difference between the electronegativities of two numbers is between 0 and 0 0.4, we can consider this to be consider this to be covalent. All right? So if the EN difference between these, the strength rating I like to call it, between these two individuals, these two atoms, is small enough, 0 to 0 0.4, 0 to 0 0.4, we can consider that bond to be covalent, meaning those electrons are going to be equally shared between those two atoms, just because they have such a small difference in the strength, so it's like a tug of war between twins. Now, if the delta En, the difference in electronegativities between the two atoms is between 1.7 and 4.0, we consider this to be ionic. All right. So if there's a huge difference between the strength ratings, uh, let's see, 
huge difference between the strength ratings of these two atoms. So over here, 0 0.9 versus 3.0, that's a big difference in the strength ratings, right? Or electronegativity numbers. Then we can consider that to be an unequal fight or an unequal sharing of electrons, where one atom will totally rip away an electron from the other one, leaving a permanent negative charge on one and a permanent positive charge on the other. And now they are both ions, so it's called an ionic bond. If, on the other hand, we have a difference uh, in EN values between 0 0.4 and 1.7, we call it polar covalent. I can't write. Polar covalent meaning that the difference between the two is not completely equal, not a total ripoff, but somewhere in between. And that's where we get the partial charges occurring. So let's do some quick calculations. Uh, let's first start off with the ionic bond between Na and Cl, 0 0.9, 3.0. So what we do is we do our calculation here. Chlorine has an En value of 3.0. Sodium has an En value of 0 0.9. To find the difference between the two, we subtract. So usually what we do is we put the larger En value at the front and the less e, uh, the lower En value. Uh, we subtract it from that one. So 3.0 minus 0 0.9 equals to 2.1. Looking at the delta En 2.1, 2.1 lies somewhere here, which means it is going to be an ionic compound. And as you can see, sodium and chlorine, ionic bond. If you take a look at chlorine chlorine, it's pretty simple to do. 3.0 minus 3.0 equals, well, 0. So 0 lies in the covalent range. So this is definitely a covalent bond. And last one would be between the hydrogen and the oxygen, 3.5 versus a 2.1. So again, oxygen with the higher EN value goes first, 3.5 minus 2.1 equals to 1.4. 1.4 is well within the range of polar covalent. Now, a quick little note, these uh, border lines over here, 0 0.4 and 1.7, they aren't exactly strict uh, rules. Meaning, if it's uh, 1.7, it doesn't mean it has to be uh, polar covalent or ionic. Right? I like to think of these as gray areas. It's a spectrum. It's like saying, um, once you turn 18, you are an adult. But does that mean that as soon as you're 18, you are automatically mature? No. I mean, some people mature earlier, and some people will never mature. So this is a more of a gray area. So if you do a calculation, your delta EN values, and you find that it's 0 0.4, my recommendation is to err on the side of caution and pretend it is polar covalent. All right? So if it's uh, 0 0.3 even, I might even be tempted to say polar covalent since it's so close to this transition area. Same thing over here. As soon as you hit 1.7, it doesn't mean you are going to be ionic. All right? uh, chances are I would probably do a little plus or minus 0.1 within these two border lines. And uh, anywhere within those gray areas, I would still consider it to be polar covalent. Right? Partial charges, not full charges on this side, not no charges on this side, but a partial charge over here. So just err on the side of caution. When in doubt, just uh, assume it is a polar covalent bond instead. All right, so how does all this affect the physical uh, properties of uh, different compounds? Let's take a look at this situation over here. Ionic compounds and their melting points. Now, because ionic compounds have a total giveaway, you get total, par uh, total charges. Total negative, total positive. If you take a look at this situation, I'm going to pretend this is sodium, this is chlorine, then sodium, then chlorine, sodium, chlorine, sodium, chlorine, and it just alternates back and forth, back and forth. Now, because sodium and chlorine have opposite charges, we know that opposite charges will attract each other. Right, So the sodium and the chlorine are really strongly attracted to each other because of their uh, charges over here. As such, the sodium and chlorine are held very, very tightly together. You're going to need a lot of energy, so as I increase the energy over here, to break them apart. Notice how I increase the energy, but they're still held together? Because of the positive and the negative charges, they are attracting each other, holding each other very tightly. This is why ionic compounds have a very, very high melting point. So for instance, salt, sodium chloride, table salt, has a melting point of 801 degrees Celsius. So sodium chloride has a melting point of 801 degrees Celsius. You need 801 degrees Celsius worth of energy in order to rip these two ions away from each other because of the positive and negative attraction. Once you do give it enough energy, 
once you do give it enough energy, that's when they start to melt and they liquefy at that point. And of course, if you give it even more energy, they turn into a gas state, right? Gas, liquid, then into a solid state. All right, so they have a very high melting point and a very high boiling point. Now, on the other hand, on the opposite end of the scale, covalent compounds are equally shared. And because the electrons are equally shared, no chlorine gets the electrons or loses the electrons. And so if there's no net gain or loss, they don't have a charge. So the charges are neutral. So again, looking at the situation, if this was a chlorine molecule, and this was a chlorine molecule, this was a chlorine molecule, this was another one, uh, the attraction between the two, there's not much of an attraction between them because it's a neutral charge. And so it's very easy to melt them apart because their attraction that's holding them together is very, very weak. So weak, in fact, that negative 101 degrees Celsius, negative 101 degrees Celsius, that's more than enough energy to move the chlorines apart and uh, basically melt them apart away, breaking their bonds, turning them from solid to a liquid. And so that's why covalent compounds have a very low melting point and a very low boiling point. And finally, if we look at the in-between bonds, well, we can expect to have an in-between melting point, right? So it's not a complete positive negative charge like we see with an ionic compound. So you won't have a very, very strong attraction between the opposite ends. But at the same time, it's not like this one where there are no charges at all. So because there's a partial charge, there's a partial attraction between the H and the O, H and the O, H and the O, H and the O. So there's a slight positive, slight negative charge attracting them. And that's why you need moderate amount of energy to melt it apart. And so if we use water as an example, H2O, notice how the H has a partial positive charge, partial positive charge, and the oxygen has a partial negative charge, as we saw over here. Well, this partial positive, slight positive charge, and this slight negative charge, they do attract each other slightly. And that's why I draw little dots over here to show that there's a slight attraction. On the other hand, over here, with the total positive, total negative, you get a definite attraction, a very solid attraction between these two. And as we all know, water has a melting point of zero degrees Celsius. So not as high as an ionic compound, 801 degrees Celsius, but definitely not as low as a covalent compound, negative 101 degrees Celsius. It's somewhere nice in the middle. Polar covalent. Polar covalent. So it has a moderate, we'll say a medium melting point and boiling point as well. All right. Again, we're running out of time. Uh, we're getting close to that 15 minute mark, uh, 15 minute limit from YouTube. So I'll have to continue this in the next video clip. And we'll talk about uh, solubility of polar compounds and nonpolar compounds in water.